Ohio State is going to be Penn State's toughest matchup to date. Both of these teams on paper are actually really close, but as injuries pile up, who really has the edge? You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is a Locked On crossover episode with Locked On Nittany Lions and Locked On Buckeyes. My name is Zach Seiko with Locked On Nittany Lions. He is Jay Stevens of Locked On Buckeyes, and we are previewing this Penn State Ohio State game, trying to get an understanding of where these teams are, as this matchup is going to be very close. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers can place a $5 bet, and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel handle.com to get started. Jay, there's a lot to cover here because both teams are not as healthy as they would like to be. That's college football. There are some key positional matchups that I look at where Ohio State has a clear-cut advantage, but I'm eager to get the the Buckeyes point of view of it. Let's let's actually start with the overall health of the team. Because Drew Aller is looking to be a game-time decision on Penn State's side of things. Deny Dennis Sutton is looking to be a game-time decision as well, starting defensive end for Penn State. And then I've just kind of casually heard through the grapevine that Ohio State is dealing with some pretty significant bumps and bruises as well. You're exactly right there, Zach. They got a bump and bruise at a key player on the offensive line, and Josh Simmons, he's out for the year, got hurt. Uh, in the Oregon game this past weekend, his replacement, first game starting, Zed Mahalski, he went down. He's probably, my gut says he's probably not going to play. On defense, Lathan Ransom, who has been, some say the MVP of the Buckeyes defense, he missed a game a week ago. He's probably, my gut says, not going to play this weekend. So you're losing guys that are going to get drafted, guys that have been key positions, key positional players. So it's weird that in this game, Penn State is, could be without a guy on the D-line and their quarterback, and Ohio State's lost potentially two left tackles and then a safety for this game. And there's other guys that have bumps and bruises. When you get this time of year, guys are dinged up, guys have this, guys have that, but you got to battle through it to win big-time matchups like what we're going to get on Saturday. And that, and that is really interesting because it's not only just from Penn State side of things. I mean, Drew Aller uh, sustained what is is a knee injury, could probably be from the eye test, an MCL injury, and should he should be available. He should be, but that is a game-time decision, as James Franklin has alluded to. Nicholas Singleton, star running back for Penn State, is not 100%. He's going to be available, but he's still he's still banged up. How is, I think it's Quinshawn Judkins is dealing with bumps and bruises of his own too, Jay. Yeah, he hasn't missed any time. He got hurt, I believe, going into the org. I think going into the Oregon game, and um, he is a guy that this past weekend neither he nor Travion Henderson did anything on the ground game. I think the the most I think Quinshawn may have had twenty nine yards rushing. Travion was less. Both had ten carries, and so I don't think that his lack of production is to him individually because it's to his hands, not to his feet or his knees or his legs. It's a hand injury, but I do think with their lack of production, it's the offensive line as a whole and losing Josh Simmons was a massive loss this past Saturday and Nebraska took advantage of it. And I do want to ask about that Nebraska game in this opening segment, but looking at the overall matchup, so it it seems like it's almost an eye for an eye in this case, player for player with Penn State missing one key guy, but on the flip side of it, Ohio State is missing a different key guy that kind of almost balances it out a little bit. But when you look at this matchup, beyond the injuries or who may or may not be available. Penn State and Ohio State are right there. When you look at pro football focus, both teams are top five in the power rankings. If you look at the actual team grades themselves, Ohio State is number three. Penn State is number five in overall team grade. And then the power rankings, they're four and five. Ohio State is better. And then, Jay, this is a stat that I always love to bring up, yards per play and yards per play allowed. Ohio State has a top five offense and a top five defense when it comes to both of those categories. Penn State has a top 10 offense and a top 10 defense when it comes to both of those categories. So there is a reason why Ohio State is only a three and a half point favorite going into this game. Granted, Penn State has home field advantage here, but both teams are really close with one another. They're really close. I'm going to go to that home field advantage here quickly. I was going to wait till later to do this, Zach, but... I think Ohio State fans and myself included are so happy this is a 12 noon kickoff and not a whiteout <laughs> at night or a night game. It, mm-hmm. it may not have to be a whiteout, but just night environment there in Happy Valley mm-hmm. is so different than almost any other atmosphere in college football. I mean, you're rivaling Kyle Field on his best day and 
Death Valley down to the bayou to be like the top of the elite atmospheres in college football. Literally, if it was a night game, Ohio State it would struggle massively like they did mm. against Oregon and Austin Stadium. But no, man, this – this I'm weird with this game. I, I know you made a comment earlier. I'm just going to say I'm weird. And that it being a road game right now is uh, – yeah. It's going to hurt Ohio State, honestly. I really do think it's going to. If it were at home, I'd be more comfortable. But this road test, I don't care what time the game is getting kicked off, it's going to be difficult. That's crazy here because I – the, the general public will say that, oh, Ohio State should be a 10-point, 14-point favorite, and I wholeheartedly disagree with that. But I'm still leaning, you know, we'll get to our game and actual score predictions because I'm leaning, just based on some of the positional matchups, leaning towards that uh, Ohio, Ohio State victory here, but I want to ask about that Nebraska game. 21 to 17. It was a little too close for comfort. Ohio State uh, eventually retook the lead in the fourth quarter. They got it back rather quickly. Nebraska, I think, I don't put a lot of stock into that personally, Jay, but I'm looking at it from the 1,000-foot point of view. Yeah. Nebraska has nothing to lose. Their season no. kind of went off the rails a little bit. Their goals had to be readjusted, and they said, hey, let's go play spoiler on the road. Whereas Ohio State still has Penn State, Indiana, Michigan, and they believe that they can play in a Big Ten championship if all goes well. So they're playing the long game in this case. They, I, I'm not saying that they didn't try, but when you look at different opponents, you're not going to put your best playbook out there against Nebraska that you know you can beat with 50 to 75% of your best plays available. You know, that's a good thought. But I think the issue that Ohio State have, fans have right now is something Ryan Day said in the first 60 seconds of his presser, Ohio State can't run the ball. It wasn't the issues that they just had against Oregon running the ball in the second half. It was second half against Oregon and the entire game against Nebraska. Now, you know Nebraska has a, one of the best run defenses in the Big Ten, and that showed up in a big way in Ohio Stadium on Saturday. But Ohio State couldn't get a push. Like, they couldn't do mm. anything. And so I think some of the issues Ohio State fans have right now, especially going from a bye week, the Nebraska game, and then the Penn State game, is if you can't run the ball in the second half against Oregon and for the entire game against Nebraska with the bye week in between those two, why should fans expect Ohio State to be able to run the ball against Penn State? Now, I did just say Nebraska's rush defense is, is really good. Yes, they are. But the difference is, I don't know if Ohio State on the interior or the exterior is going to have a massive advantage to where you're going to say, oh, we're going to run here. Well, if you want to run here, you might need to change the scheme up just a tad to make sure that can happen. And Chip Kelly a week ago didn't do that. So that's where my confusion comes in. In the games like this, big time games, you have to be able to run the ball. Ohio State in the past six quarters has struggled to run the ball. And that scares me, really worries me about this game because I don't think they'll be able to at all because of their own, not just injury issues, but schematic issues and coaches yeah. not helping the players out in every way area that they need to to make sure the Buckeyes are successful on the ground. That's so interesting to me. I, I want to point something out just about what, what Ohio State has available to them. It, most importantly, so yes, when coaches say the battle is won up front, that's Ohio State's offensive line because Will Howard has dual threat capabilities. Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson are in that backfield. The only other comparable backfield is Nicholas Singleton and Katron Allen. That dynamic duo of running backs who could be probably taken no later in the second round when both of those, all four of those guys are drafted. I don't, maybe Katron Allen a little later, but Nicholas Singleton, Travion Henderson, Quinshawn Judkins are at least day two NFL draft picks. Both teams are certainly not at their best. And like I said, kind of with the missing pieces, mm -hmm. it seems a, a neutralized to this point. But I, when I look at it from Penn State's perspective, Tom Allen defensively, Andy Kotelnicki offensively are going to have to call the games of their lives. With Drew Aller's availability in flux, could Penn State win with Bo Prabula? Well, Jay, I'm sure you have a lot of questions, intel that you want to gather about the Nittany Lions, and we're going to discuss some more of those key matchups on the other side of this break. 
And today's episode is brought to you by Roy. Hey, Nittany Lion fans, it's time to recognize our Roy Player of the Week. So far this season, we've pooled over $20,000 to support players on Roy. Micro deposits lead to massive change. With the Roy app, you can direct your support to the athletes that you like, ensuring that all the funds go to the specific player that you choose. Unlike collectives, you know exactly where your support is going, and you even receive exclusive content like personal videos and updates after the season. The best part of all of this is it is risk-free it is risk-free if the athlete transfers or doesn't deliver on that promised content you get your money back this week my Roy player of the week is none other than Bo Prabula how about Prabula to come off of the bench ice cold help lead Penn State to victory against Wisconsin in a tough road matchup 98 yards through the air 28 on the ground 11 of 13 as well I just pitched in $100 you can pitch in on Roy too even just as little as ten dollars download the roy download the roy app now and join the L nil game with no subscriptions no fees and be sure to check out roy on social media plus don't miss out on roy's exciting giveaway you can win two tickets to a game in november all you got to do is download roy create an account and enter referral code locked on and you're entered if you're already on roy any contribution to an athlete's campaign also get you entered in automatically. No purchase necessary and void where prohibited. Again, that is Roy. Support the players. Change the game. As we continue this crossover with the Locked On Buckeyes, the Locked On, Locked on Nittany Lions podcast, I'm very curious, Zach, about one guy. He's QB1 for Penn State, and he has been someone since week number one. I believe that was the West Virginia game. Where I saw Drew Aller, and last year we did this show, and I was like, oh, I'm not really sold after the Ohio State game. Oh, I'm not really sold. He's making me more of a believer in what he is as a quarterback, and I'm curious to hear how he has played this year because I have been impressed with his play this year, and I'm curious if you've been impressed too. Well, I appreciate that just as two people that understand college football, <laughs> neutrally, objectively. And, I, and I, I, I continue to rehash this. Anybody that says that Drew Aller is mediocre or that he's bad or that he doesn't have a future in the NFL is just it, is a Penn State hater, is a Drew Aller hater, or is just trying to be a troll. Because that is not an objectively correct opinion anymore. That is an, an assessment. Or you're just not paying attention yeah. or you don't know ball. At the end of the day, Drew Aller is completing 70% above his passes. He's still protecting the football very well. And he's just making smarter decisions, smarter reads. And you add an element of his running ability to the game. And that's why this knee injury or presumed knee injury is so important. Because if it affects his mobility, that's a subtle part of his game where he's able to slide in the pocket, roll out, extend the play. And if you need to, pick up 5 to 10 yards when the defense is least expecting it. So Drew Aller is finally playing to Penn State's expectations. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he's playing above expectations. These were my expectations. I expected Drew to be that field general, take that big step forward. What I'm really intrigued by is, is the off-the-field stuff, the leadership, the way that he's <laughs> commanded himself as a captain, as a veteran player. Uh, there's a viral video that, if you yeah. read lips very well, he's cursing out somebody on the sideline. We still don't know who, but he's just fired up. He's passionate, and it's the right kind of emotion that we didn't see when he was a 19-year-old starting quarterback. He's now 20. He's in his third year of college football, and it's the way that he's grown up in the season. He's always had the physical tools, the actual football talent it's the stuff that you, you need a life coach for and I think Drew Allers ha has responded very well in that way he's responded very well he's made a lot of what I call big boy throws and I believe mm -hmm. one he's of them not came, afraid he's no, not fearless. afraid at all he, he one of them was a a touchdown pass week one and I was like oh okay we're already seeing the growth of, of Drew Aller right now uh, right before our eyes if he is not able to play this weekend which it's he's literally a game time decision as you mentioned Mm -hmm. Do you have faith that Bo Prabula can get the job done and lead Penn State to a, a win? Yes. Yes. In, in short, yes, I do. Uh, and I think it's interesting from Ohio State's perspective for Jim Knowles, the defensive coordinator, and this, you know, you and I can bounce back and forth on this. I think Ohio State has even more work cut out for them defensively. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you don't know who the starter is, James Franklin just had his weekly press conference here. It's nice to do this, uh, this crossover episode for our Tuesday show. But on Monday, James Franklin said, you know, hey, we're going to have them both practice and, and Drew's going to be a game time decision. That does not help the Buckeyes. They have to because 
okay, you're Drew Aller's the starting quarterback if he is as close to 100% as possible. If he's 100%, I'd say even go to like maybe even 75. Penn State would feel comfortable with him still being QB1. But what if they don't? What if they don't? Bo Prabula showed me that he is much better as an actual quarterback, that he's not just going to lean on his running ability because he is a different quarterback. He's a dual threat quarterback, but it was when in doubt, I can use my legs to do whatever, play some hero ball, but no, he's going through his progressions. He's making quick, clean, accurate passes with some zip on the football. We didn't know what Bo Prabula was as a passer. Now we do against a Wisconsin secondary that is better. They are above average. They're respectable. And Bo Prabula to be able to do that in one half of play on the road like that when he's thrusted into game action, Bo Prabula can lead this team to victory against Ohio State and anybody else for the remainder of the regular season for Penn State if they need him to. So you mentioned deny Dennis Sutton is a game time decision on Saturday. Everybody yes. knows about Abdul Carter and what he is. But if deny Dennis Sutton can't go and it's just Abdul Carter doing his thing, do you think Penn State will be able to get a rush on Will Howard? If you're what you're telling me about the offensive line is, yeah, yeah. is uh, Smith Vilbert and me and Vanover, these are guys that have stepped up in a rotational role. They could be starters if they needed to be, but when you have Deny Dennis Sutton, who's an athletic freak and is one of the leaders across the nation and tackles for a loss. So Penn State hasn't gotten home for the sack play because offenses are just trying to get the football out as quick as possible. Having Deny Dennis Sutton at 50%, even if he plays, just having him rotate in because he's not going to play the full game. I just That's my understanding of it based on him trying to give it a go against Wisconsin for the second half. It's a groin injury. That's the, 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 yeah, the evidence. It's like somebody, uh, somebody else pointed out that it's kind of like hamstring injuries where that yeah. just lingers for the remainder of the season. You really don't get back to 110% until you can rest for a month, two months' time. So... This is something that he's going to be dealing with. Thank goodness Penn State has two veteran players like Vanover and Smith Vilbert. I am confident in their ability, but it's certainly not to the level of a denied Dennis Sutton and certainly not even further to a level of Abdul Carter. I, I'm very curious about this next one because this past weekend, Ohio State did not lean on Emeka Buka and Jeremiah Smith like I, I thought they should have with the uh, Buckeyes' inability to run the ball. How do you think that Penn State will be able to cover Abuka and Jeremiah Smith yeah. on Saturday afternoon? That's the matchup I'm looking for, both both sides actually, Jay. And this is why, like I said at the beginning, I lean towards the Buckeyes here. Penn State has, yes, USC's passing attack it is it has a lot of variety of talent, but doesn't have it as condensed as a Jeremiah Smith, who's going to be a first, probably a top five pick. Yeah. A Mecca Buka, who could have gone to the NFL draft this year, but didn't, and will probably be a first or a second round pick. And Carnell Tate is starting to get into his mm -hmm. own. And then if they need to turn to Brandon Ennis, right, the, the, all those guys just have potential that is through the roof at the end of the day. They're all first round types of players. The only, the only person that I see in the secondary as that type of player, okay, there's Jalen Reed who's playing much better than anticipated this season, maybe not from, from the Penn State locker room, but to the outsider and even to the media, okay, now Jalen Reed may be a day two pick at the end of the day, but he's a roaming safety and they're going to use him not necessarily in man-to-man -man against Smith or Igbuka. A.J. Harris, all the potential in the world, former top 50 recruit. Is he as good as Emeka Ibuka is now? Is he as good? Maybe in a year or two years' time, they're comparable. But I'm going to give the veteran wide receiver the edge. I'd give Jeremiah Smith the edge in those one-on-one -on -one matchups. And then you flip, and then Jalen Kimber, Zion Tracy, uh, Davian Collins, all these other guys. I would not want them covering those guys in one-on-one. -on -one. If Penn State, that's why I say they're going to have to coach the games of their lives. In Tom Allen's case, he's got to run a ton of zone. You do not win those man-to-man -man matchups against Jeremiah Smith and Abuka and, and anybody else. So if Will Howard has even a split extra second of time to allow those receivers to get open, the passing game is going to be working for the Buckeyes. So Penn State's probably putting together a zone plan that it is maybe necessarily hasn't been put on tape, but they're going to run a lot more zone than man, I would hope, because they don't win those man-to-man -man matchups. And then you flip it over to the other side for the wide receivers, Denzel Burke, Caleb Downs in that secondary. I you The other defense... 
Ohio State runs a 4-2-5 as well. I don't see Trey Wallace against Denzel Burke. I'd give Burke the edge in that matchup. Julian Fleming's now at Penn State, but he's going up against comparable cornerbacks that I just think are frankly better than what Penn State's wide receivers have to offer. Well, last thing here, and I see we're moving here pretty quickly here through the show. What would a win on Saturday mean for James Franklin? I think it would be huge because, what, it's been almost a decade since, yeah, pretty much. since Penn State has beaten Ohio State. They should have went on that three-game winning streak, 2016, 17, and 18, but they didn't. They had the lead, double-digit leads, and they blew them, whether it was in Columbus or at Penn State. So this would be huge. However, they can afford this loss to Ohio State. So it's not a must. It's a must-win with Penn State wanting to be in the Big Ten Championship as a, a get a buy in the college football playoff, but it does not jeopardize their season the way it did in the past. They can go 11 and one. They are still in control of their own destiny. And depending on some tiebreakers could end up in the big 10 championship when all said and done. So this game, they don't need to put all of their stock into this game. It doesn't ruin the season. If they lose to the Buckeyes. Got to hear the Penn state point of view. Now it's time to flip the page and hear about Ohio State. Ohio State had a weird game against Nebraska. Some people think they're struggling. Will that continue on Saturday in Happy Valley? We'll find out next. And let's hear from another one of our sponsors on today's show, and that is FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet just $5 and you'll get $150 in bonus bets. If you win, the FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL and so much more, and it's all in one place. So when you get that hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out all the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more, and it's all on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today, and if you look over at FanDuel.com, Ohio State is a three-and-a-half point favorite against Penn State. The total is set at 47 and a half. If you like those lines, you can bet them right now over at FanDuel.com. Again, just visit FanDuel.com to join today, and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Again, that is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, Jay, we'll wrap it up here. Just kind of talk about what we think, the, how the game will go, the game will flow, and some final score predictions as well. And if you got a final score prediction, let us know down in the comments section. I, Jay, I, this game is going to be close. I, I think that it kind of almost like the game the way it was in 2022 when it was at Beaver Stadium last time. There, there might not be this explosion of big plays until maybe later in the game, if there is at all. I mean, these are two... Ohio State's got a top five defense. Penn State certainly has a top 10 defense just on the outside of the top five. Both teams are extremely talented. I just look at some of those positional matchups, and I don't know that Penn State has an answer for Ohio State's wide receivers, Ohio State's defensive backs, unless Andy Kotelnicki and Tom Allen put together. And I also look, this is one that we haven't talked about yet. Ohio State's defensive line against Penn State's offensive line. Yeah. They are they are getting better every single week because they've never yes, they played together and they're all vet they all have veteran experience, but they've never started as a group of five. They lost all of their credit all of their quality starters from a season ago, including an Olu Fashnu, who was the number one a number eleven pick in the NFL draft. This group is average. They, sometimes they have their moments. Sometimes they're, it's surprising, and it's like, okay, you're doing... They also haven't really been tested. Illinois' defensive line, USC's defensive line, Wisconsin's defensive line, West Virginia's defensive line, and the front sevens as well have been below average. I look at JT Tuimaloa, who should be a first-round pick, Jack Sawyer, who's certainly playing into a first-round pick, those defensive tackles for Ohio State. You want to talk about Ohio State's offensive line problems, I don't think Penn State's offensive line has been challenged to this point either. That's one of those matchups, man. We talk about the game being one, be, needing to be one in the trenches. Ohio State's run, if it was just a D line and, and like run game stuff, I'd be cool. Like, I have no issues. Mm -hmm. The issues that we find is that Ohio State does need a blitz to get pressure on to the quarterback, or when they do try to get pressure with four, it's been an issue at times. So. I don't know. This, that's a matchup where I, my, I'm fixated on it. I'm curious. We're doing this earlier in the week, and I'm mm -hmm. still kind of down from that Nebraska game, which does kind of mess up my 
clarity about how I'll think about this later in the week. But that's one thing. Yeah, Ohio State should have the advantage. Will they? We'll see. What about the linebackers? Because I don't know that for Ohio State, the the linebacker play, according to pro football focus, has not been the best. Do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? No, I'm I'm right there. I'm right there. Hasn't been the best. Cody Simon this past weekend, one of the captains, had maybe one of his best games of the year, had key stops on the final Nebraska drive. The final play Nebraska had ended up being an interception that Dylan Rayola threw. But now Cody Simon has been one of those guys that he's not like a like a, a household name around the country, but he's getting the job done. He's a Mike linebacker. He is solid. He's a program guy, and he's doing everything that he's needed to do and stepping up and having his best year as a Buckeye. Everybody else, though, like Arvell Reese, guy who had the targeting call, and mm-hmm. Sonny Styles and C.J. Hicks, hit or miss sometimes, inconsistent play, and the coaches have kind of realized that, so they're trying to do different packages to try to compensate for the issues at linebacker, and it's sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So the linebacker play is one of those where – if they play good ball, sound ball, it'll be fine. I think they'll be good. I just don't know if that's what's going to happen across the board for every linebacker that steps on the field. Keys to the game, and then we'll get to our actual final score predictions here. I'm From, from Penn State's point of view, to win this game, I think they need to go with the two-quarterback system. Like This is what I mean when I say Penn State can coach its way to victory here. Just because I, I think Ohio State is extremely talented – Chip Kelly and Jim Knowles are some of the best coordinators in the country, but that doesn't, but the margin of error here with now Andy Kotelnicki and Tom Allen at the helm, and you're getting this game later in the season as opposed to earlier in the season. Penn State still needs to get familiar with itself, believe it or not. That's why they have these slow starts. So Andy Kotelnicki, it actually might benefit the offense to have Drew Aller play half of the time. And then Bo Prabula play some more snaps than he regularly would just to give that element of surprise and really have Ohio State have to work to stop Penn State's offense and sustain drives and keep Abuka, Smith, Tate, and that offense off of the field, particularly the passing game. From Tom Allen's point of view, you have to run zone. I, I don't think you can get away with man-to-man defense. I don't think you can get away with cover three. You're going to have to run some different coverage blitzes. Mm-hmm. You're going to, all, you're you're going to have to come up with a game plan defensively that Ohio State almost hasn't seen on on tape to this point. And for Penn State defensively, is they are also going to have to force turnovers. I don't I don't exactly know how you do that because I know Will Howard has four interceptions to this point, mm-hmm. but he's a veteran quarterback. Yeah. He has dual threat ability. He has Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson to lean on. And he can so and he and he can move himself. So they have three capable runners in the backfield to go along with a variety of passing targets. If you can force one or two turnovers, that is all the difference. And easier said than done. But one one turnover more on Penn State side just might be the difference to get a win against the Buckeyes in Beaver Stadium. Zach, same thing though for Ohio State. I'm gonna kind of go backwards and forwards for my keys to mm-hmm. Ohio State to win. Ohio State must force turnovers. And that's one thing that Ohio State generally does a good job of. Got one in the very last offensive play Nebraska had this past weekend. They have caused numerous fumbles. And this is very, there's been a defense that has taken advantage of key moments, stopping plays. Is that an Iowa game? Iowa did nothing in the second half because it seemed like every time Iowa got the ball, Ohio State forced a turnover. And in big games like this, they must force turnovers multiple, not just one, force Mm -hmm. multiple turnovers. And it could just be very well. Hey, first guy that gets to the ball, wraps the guy up. Second guy punches the ball out. Stuff like that is stuff that needs to happen this weekend. Also, you got to lean on Emeka Buka and Travion Henderson. Excuse me, Emeka Buka and Jeremiah Smith, which may it goes against my gut as a football analyst because it's always run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. But with Ohio State having offense, offensive line issues, a week ago, if they leaned on the number two and number four against Nebraska – they blow them out. Like, we're not having the same – I wouldn't have the same feeling because the outcome is Ohio State by 21 to 24 points because they just leaned on the future first-round picks on the outside. That might need to happen in this game for Ohio State to win the game, which goes into number 18, Will Howard. He is a – like, I, I won't say the ultimate game manager, but he is more of a game manager who is having a career year. That was my prediction for him this year. He was going to come in. He was going to – he had the potential of raising his completion percentage – um, being a guy that's going to raise his draft stock at the same time and lead the Buckeyes offense, make it to the playoff, and have them uh, give them a shot to win the national championship. All that is still up for play. 
But Will Howard has to have a game, man. Has to have a good game. Mm. The last play against Oregon, you can't have that mental blunder. Some of the things that happened earlier in the game, the mistakes he made, you can't have those errors in this game because Ohio State needs him to be the game manager, be the quarterback that they brought him in here to be, to beat Penn State on Saturday. Let's finish up with our final score predictions again. Let us know yours down in the comments section. 47 and a half is the total uh, via FanDuel. I'm going to go over here. I think Ohio State scores 27 and Penn State scores 24. That's my final score, 27 to 24. I think Ohio State just has enough talent in position groups that Penn State does not match up well with. But that's not to say that Penn State can't win this game. It's certainly not impossible. But I lean the Buckeyes in this case by a field goal. That three point, that three and a half point spread is airtight for a reason. Zach, I am going to pick the same numbers. It's flip flop and I talked to you before. Oh the my show. gosh. <laughs> Literally 27 Penn State, 24 Ohio State. That wow. was the last number I put on my notebook before um, coming on the show. I just don't have faith in the offensive line. I have faith wow. in the guys on the outside. I have faith in Will Howard. I have faith in I have faith in the running backs to get the job done. With the way the offensive line has had has shown a massive inability to pass block, even blocked block the run a week ago, that really makes me very, very, very nervous going on the road once again. It's going to be a loud environment. Still wish it was going to be a night game. It's still going to be loud, a sellout crowd. The defense, though, I think the defense will play a whole lot better. Wouldn't shock me if the defense had a scoop and score or a pick six. But the offensive line, those issues are going to continue. If you tell me Donovan Jackson is at left tackle, not left guard, I'm nervous, man. I'm very nervous about that. Uh, Penn State winning for the first time since, what, 2016? Uh, pains me to yeah. say it, man, but uh, that's, where my, that's where I'm leaning right now. Wow, who would have thought at the end of the show that the the hosts of their respective teams would pick the opposing team? And that's how we're going to finish up this Locked On crossover. Very entertaining, very informative. Jay, thanks so much for the time. and glad we could get to do this show together. I enjoy it every time we can get uh, on a show together, Zach, and looking forward to a good game on Saturday.